Welcome to today's virtual media conference to apprise you of government's efforts to combat COVID-19. Joining me today are the Minister of Health, the Honorable Terence Dial Singh, the Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Roshan Parasram, and the Medical Director at the St. James Medical Complex, the Head of Oncology, National Radiotherapy Center, and Chair of the National Cancer Care Coordinating Committee, Dr. Kelly Allen Mike. I will now introduce the Minister of Health, the Honorable Terence D. Singh, to give you an update on COVID-19 in Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you, Minister Cox. Good morning to Trinidad and Tobago. Good morning to the Chief Medical Officer sitting to my left. Good morning to Dr. Kelly Allen Mike. Uh, good morning, Trinidad and Tobago. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen of the media. Yesterday, as we said, marked a very grim milestone where the world battling this global pandemic reached its one millionth case. At 8 a.m. this morning, there were 1,133,453 cases around the world. Two hours later, just before coming on air at 10 a.m., there was 1,139,120 cases. I tell you this, so you can understand, in two hours around the world, there was an increase of 5,667 cases globally in just two hours. At 8 a.m. this morning, when I tracked the figure for deaths, there were 60,397 deaths globally. Two hours later, 61,144. It means in two hours, between 8 a.m. and 10 a.m. this morning, an additional 747 people around the world died of coronavirus. Those statistics should shock Trinidad and Tobago, if you weren't already shocked, into receiving the message of stay home and be safe. What is Trinidad and Tobago's profile as of 10 a.m. this morning? Samples tested to date, 728. Positive cases, 101. But when you take out the cruise ship cohort of 49, it means outside of that 101, we have 52 cases. And that is statistically what we are paying attention to the 52. Clinically, we pay attention to all 101. We still have six deaths with one person being discharged. I want to bring to the attention to the national community that no place on earth, no matter how remote, underpopulated, can escape this virus. Shockingly, but not surprisingly, the Falkland Islands which is as remote as you can get, a group of islands off the coast of Argentina near Antarctica, with a population of only 2,840 people. They have recorded their first case of coronavirus. No place on earth, no matter how remote, is immune from this virus. That's a global picture, that's a local picture. Yesterday, I started a conversation about what we are doing to one of the most vulnerable populations in Trinidad and Tobago. And that are those elderly who are in our homes for the age and long stay homes. We estimate that we have probably about 3,000 to 6,000 elderly across about 169 registered homes, but you also have the unregistered homes. We will be publishing next week the formal guidelines for all homes to be followed. But I just want to touch on them briefly because we don't know who the informal homes are. As of today, we are advising that all these homes stop visiting by friends and relatives. If you have to take supplies, medication, a favorite snack, a favorite treat, do that. But you should not allow anyone to come into your homes and the chief medical officer will speak as to why. We are asking all homes that cleanliness and sanitation now becomes 
crucial. Because if you follow what is happening in Italy and other countries, elderly in these long-stay homes are bearing the brunt of fatalities. We are asking that the caregivers in these homes wear masks and gloves, not to protect themselves necessarily, but to protect those that they are taking care of. And use disposable gloves and dispose it when you move from person to person so you don't transmit the virus. We are asking these homes to do rudimentary basic checks on the health of your employees. Do not let them go into a home if they have a fever or a cough. We are asking people in these homes to space out the elderly as much as humanly possible. To accomplish that, we are asking friends and relatives, if possible, to take care and take these people out of that environment and put them into your own home to lessen, and to in, to lessen the chance of spread. And we are asking the owners of these homes and operators to keep a daily clinical log of symptoms of your long-stay um, uh, patients their fevers, and so on. All these homes will be under the control of the County Medical Officer of Health, and we have put out infection prevention control guidelines. But it can only work if the advice and protocols we are giving out are implemented by home owners. So I want to focus on this very vulnerable group this morning, and the CMO will explain to you why this group is particularly vulnerable to COVID-19. Thank you, Minister Cox. Thank you very much, Minister Dial Singh. Let's hear from the Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Roshan Paraswam, who will provide us with a clinical update. Good morning, um, Honorable Ministers, members of the viewing and listening public. So as of today, the 4th of April 20, 2020, the total number of cases, as Minister would have said, is 101. The number of patients in hospital as present it stands at 93. And the disaggregation is as follows. For Scarborough Hospital, we still have one patient in ICU ventilated. For Cora, there are now 26 persons, all ambulatory, in, in very good state, in a very good state. Coover, total number of patients, 66. There are two persons in ICU, one of them being ventilated. In HDU, there are now 11 persons, and there are 53 ambulatory patients. Um, in terms of what Minister alluded to, in terms of the geriatric population, they are a very high-risk population. When we looked at the mortality statistics coming out of Italy and China, we found that the greatest risk of death occurs in persons over 60 years of age, and as you go higher up in age, 60s, 70s, 80s, proportionally, you find there's a greater risk of death. In keeping with international statistics, we expect that as comorbidities are added to that list, and most of the persons over 60 would have hypertension or diabetes or some other illness, it increases the risk of death. So a combined, they are very, very vulnerable population. Basically, we're trying to get those populations treated as an isolated group, so there's no, no chance of the virus coming into those settings. If the virus comes into those settings because of the way the geriatric homes are set out, there's a, there would be rapid spread amongst the persons. Most people will be affected and the rate of death in those facilities will be very great. So we are treating them as a very special population in Trinidad and Tobago. In terms of, we have been looking at the issue of mass. So I wanted to go forward with the issue of mass this morning. I had touched a couple of days ago on who and when you should wear masks. The CDC has finally published their guideline in terms of general population use of masks and the guidelines came out just yesterday indicating that those in the general population can use masks, but they should use cloth-like or homemade masks in, in every setting, especially when you're going to supermarkets, you're going to markets, you're going to pharmacies, you're going to banks, high-risk areas where you have congregation. Um, and of course, if you're traveling in, in public transport as well. So cloth-like masks, they are stating in their guidelines specifically that surgical masks and N95 masks are to be left for the medical practitioners. So the guideline, as CDC has said as of yesterday, is in keeping with what we have been saying over the past few days and weeks, that generally 
um, now everyone is asked, especially if you're going to those high-risk areas, to wear cloth-like masks and leave the N95 and the surgical masks for the healthcare professionals. Thank you. Thank you very much. It is a pleasure to now introduce Dr. Kelly Allen Mike, who will speak on cancer and COVID-19. Thank you very much, Honorable Ministers, Chief Medical Officer, um, members of the public of Trinidad and Tobago. So the impact of um, COVID-19 on cancer is still emerging as we learn more and more about this disease. Um, at the National Radiotherapy Center, where we're treating cancers, we're dividing patients into two broad groups. As we know that we keep getting the messages internationally, internationally about staying at home and staying safe. But what about our patients who need treatment, who have a, a, a disease that requires some level of control? So the two broad groups that we divide patients into are patients who are well, who have been treated for their disease, and who are basically on general follow-up, and the patients who are actively on treatment and may need a certain level of care. For our patients who are well, the advice currently, based on international recommendations, is that those patients should be postponed. So for the next two or three weeks, our patients who we know are just on regular surveillance, we have postponed their treatment as we monitor the situation and see how things evolve. Our patients, whoever, however, who are on active treatment need a different level of assessment. So those international recommendations are coming from multiple areas. We're looking across the globe, and they include areas such as North America, um, Australia, Europe, the Asian continent. We've pulled the analyses of all these different areas, and we've looked at it and applied it to our local setting. So for these patients, if you still have to come in, some patients, as they, they're being called at home and told your appointment is being delayed currently, other patients, as they come in, we've set up sanitation stations, we set up surveillance stations. Anybody who comes in first has to have a series of questions answered to determine their risk, questions regarding whether they have fever or respiratory conditions, and patients also need to sanitize using the washing stations at the entrance before they're allowed into the clinic. When you are allowed into the clinic, the doctors that are gonna see you may be discussing different treatment options with you. Those treatment options will vary depending on the type of treatment that you're on. So for patients that are on chemotherapy, some of those treatments are being changed from intravenous treatments, so treatments where you're getting an injection into the vein, to treatments where you're going to have oral therapy. The oral therapy allows us to have patients come into clinic and be seen faster, because once you leave your home, we know that you're putting yourself at risk. But we need to weigh the risk versus benefit of coming in and getting treatment to control your disease against the risk of COVID-19. So for these patients, we're trying to get them into, into treatment, into the clinic and into treatment as quickly as possible and back to their homes. But that's not an option for everybody. So in cases where there aren't oral therapies available, the other things that we're doing is trying to lengthen the time between treatments. So there are chemotherapy regimens that can be given once every week. There are others that can be stretched out to once every three weeks. By stretching out your regimen, you are still giving a degree of control of your disease, but we're also minimizing the risks in terms of you coming into clinic because we want to keep patients safe, we want to keep staff safe because you want staff to be available to treat your patients, and also you want to still allow to have as many treatments as possible. Other options, if we're not able to stretch our treatments because we need international guidelines and recommendations that are going to back that up, if that is not possible, then we are trying to lose less intense regimens Less intense regimens would still offer a degree of care, but minimize the potential for patients having immune suppression. Um, in cases where we still need to go ahead and use certain regimens, we're employing different medications that help to boost the immune system so patients can continue getting their care. All of these have to be backed up by international recommendations, international evidence. They are being used for patients with chemotherapy, but they're also being used for patients who are on radiation therapy. Some patients on radiation therapy are also at risk of immune suppression. And in cases like that, again, international bodies have been recommending trying to minimize the exposure by reducing the number of visits. So we have patients who may be coming in for treatments previously, but that would last as much as 10 treatments. And these are being compressed into five treatments, sometimes one treatment, again, based on the type of disease that we're treating and based on the evidence that is there to support it. These recommendations are not just recommendations that we're pulling and looking at the National Radiotherapy Center alone. Oncology community is small, but we communicate quite regularly. So at the, most of the other RHAs, we have been sharing these recommendations, and we're getting buying because we want to make sure that whichever facility a patient goes to, that there's uniformity of care in terms of access to care. 
And as with anything else, while we evaluate and we put things in place, we're continuing to monitor. We're monitoring to make sure that the international community has not made any new recommendations. We are adjusting as new information becomes available. And we're keeping very, very close to the pulse of what's happening to protect our patients. If you are a patient who is immunocompromised, whether you are a cancer patient or anything else, you are at an additional risk of developing infection. That's not just for COVID-19, that is for any particular type of infection. So for all of these patients, usually when we consent them for chemotherapy, they are already aware that they have to take certain practices into, con into consideration to make sure that they are safe. In the current environment that we are in, it actually allows for even better control for patients because most people are staying at home. So just you staying at home also reduces risk for other patients that have to be on these different therapies. We're encouraging the public to please follow the guidelines by the international, by the local authorities in terms of being at home and being safe. And we will continue to monitor the situation and give information as it arises. I am available for any questions if we have from the media. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Kelly Allen, Mike. Members of the media, the floor is now open. Remember to identify yourself and the media house you represent before posing your question. Stephen Cummings, 98.1. Good morning. Uh, Stephen Cummings here, 98.1 FM. Uh, Dr. Allen, are smokers and tobacco users at higher risk of COVID-19 infection? And the second question to, Ms. to Dr. Parasaram, is it safe to receive goods or a package from an area um, where COVID-19 has been confirmed, um, including locally? Dr. Allen Mike. Sorry, smokers and, I didn't hear the second group they asked about. And tobacco users. Tobacco users, okay. So that's not specifically, not necessarily a cancer question. But if you're talking about an infection that has effect on your respiratory system, and you're talking about a social habit that has been known to cause compromise to the respiratory system, then it is safe to assume that, that in some people who are smoking, and also smokers at increased risk for developing cancer, can potentially be more susceptible in terms of complications if they do succumb to an infection like COVID-19. And I think there's a question for sure. Dr. Parasram. So just to clarify, are you speaking particularly about if you're getting goods from supermarkets, those kinds of things, or are you talking about importation of goods? Mr. Cummings? Just local um, distribution. Local. Right. So um, in terms of going to your supermarket, the, the actual produce that you buy, cans, etc., should be sanitized using one of the sanitization plots or, or disinfectant solutions when you bring it home, especially things like cans, um, plastic bottles, those sorts of things, because they have droplets that can actually land on the surfaces of those objects, which we call fomites as a broad group. So they should be sanitized prior to, to actually putting into your storage, like your cupboards, whatever it may, if there's an area designated as soon as you enter your home, so you can do your sanitization in that area. That is the best way. Fruits and vegetables, we recommend to wash with soap and water prior to consumption and even prior to putting into your refrigerator or any other storage device as well. That's it? Mm -hmm. sure. Okay. I recognize Tobago Channel 5. Hi, good morning. Morning. Um, Mike? My question is kind of coming off of some of the regulations that were announced yesterday. We've been getting some calls from fishermen and so on who are a little bit apprehensive about going out to sea based on a regulation of um, not visiting the beaches and so on. Um, what can you say to that section of our population? Okay, so thank you very much. The general rule is, as both the Prime Minister has said, and both the Minister of National Security has said, and the Attorney General. Let us not rely on the force of law and the police. We are asking everyone as a community not to go out into the public domain. That is a general rule. It is difficult or impossible to legislate for every 
single activity or every single possibility. We are in the midst of a global pandemic where 61,000 people have died. Every measure that the government has put in place is a combination of legislation via regulations, but most importantly, we are using moral suasion. So everyone, fishermen, everyone, if you don't have to be in the public, please, for your own good, stay home. We understand and empathize. Some are going to be financially affected. That is unfortunate, but we are trying to save lives at this point in time. Thank you very much. There's a question online um, for Dr. Parasram. Residents of Brooklyn Settlement, Sandy Grandi, have voiced concerns of the setting up of a quarantine facility in their neighborhood. They say that there are many elderly in the area and the houses are close together. They also said that Ministry of Health officials alerted them to the setting up of the facility and handed out COVID-19 pamphlets. The concern is, has there been any discussion with residents prior to this? And what can you tell them to allay their fears? Sure. So if we're speaking about a particular area, as we had um, persons in Balandra previously, the CEO of that region will lead a team that leads that gives sensitization to the population of that specific area through community meetings, handing out the flyers. But I just want to allay your fears. When we choose an area to have patients with COVID-19 as a quarantine site, there's no risk of spread of COVID to any member of the population in that um, jurisdiction. We go to lengths to ensure that the site is so laid out that there's a certain distance between the edge of the property and even the, the dwellings within so that there can be no spread. So in this particular instance, as well as the other instances before, there has been no risk of spread to the general population. Had there been, we looked at alternate sites in all cases and the ones that we choose are the ones that will protect both the persons inside and the persons on the outside. Minister, would you like to add? Yes. yes. Uh, thank you, Minister Cox. And thank you, CMO, for reiterating there is absolutely no risk of transmission because of how carefully we choose the sites and to make sure there is distancing. Let me, let me put this in a national context. The watchwords of this country are discipline, production, and the third one is tolerance. If we live by those watchwords, we are trying to treat citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. These are people in their time of need are looking to communities to treat them humanely and with respect. I would like to think that we could rise to the occasion, rise to the occasion. The people who have COVID-19 did not bring it upon themselves, did not bring it upon themselves. And we have to be compassionate at this time, as I know we can. We have to be our brother's keeper, as I know we can. And as the chief medical officer said, we are not put in any community in danger because there is no way in an isolated setting with acreage to buffer the facility from the community and the community will be secured. The patients there will not be allowed to mix with the community. I want to give the community the absolute assurance that you will not be negatively impacted, but just remember our watchwords the last one being tolerance. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister. We now go to Wired 868. Lasana. Yes, Lasana Live with Wired 868. Um, first, you mentioned um, 93 patients today. I, I know earlier the Minister said that there were 101 positive cases. Would that mean uh, that we have 94 patients? Um, also, we know that there have been over 700 samples yeah. tested. Yeah. yeah, so in terms of the 93 and the 94, there was one patient that we got very late last night, um, beyond 12 midnight, in terms of a positive, that brought us to 101. That person will be 
arrangements are being put in place to bring that person to the hospital. So that hasn't been done as yet. It's in process. So oh, that's, that's why we, we, we got that figure, 93 as opposed to 94. Um, okay, thank you. Your second uh, question? Just repeat your second question. Second question. We, we know there have been over 700 samples sure. tested, but uh, I'm, I'm guessing several patients had multiple tests. Could yeah. you tell us how many people were actually tested? Right. And also, if you could give an update on the validation of our PCR machines, which um, you know should have been available, if you could explain the reason for the delay. Right. So in terms of, so far, um, we test a patient when they first positive, when they have symptoms. So that's one test. And then we test again when we are ready for discharge. So in terms of discharge, we, there's a criteria which I described before that we have to wait seven days and then we test. So far, there has not been a lot of a, a large number of people that have met that criteria because our first case was only on the 12th of March. So the testing in terms of repeat testing that you are alluding to, probably in the region of about 10 to 15 of that large group so far in terms of one person being tested more than once. In terms of the PCR testing, again, we are in the process of getting first North Central up and running, which is our primary site outside of CAFA. And the process of validating the kits is ongoing. We're getting more kits in as we speak. So um, as soon as we can get that site, alternate site up and running, we will have an increased capacity, not by CAFA, but by Trinidad and Tobago to do testing, which gives us a little more capacity than we have right now. But just to assure you, CAFA had received 4,000 test kits from Trinidad and Tobago, which is being used China. For, for Trinidad and Tobago donated, which we got from China a couple of weeks ago. And that is still being used on our behalf. So we don't have a deficiency in testing capacity at this point. Ian Wilson, TTT. Good morning. I know the minister this morning painted a very grim picture with some very grim figures. And in looking at the worldwide death to recovery ratio is 21% dying with 79% recovery. No. But are we taking, should we take um, encouragement from China? Because I'm, I'm using China as a reference because they would, have, they would have had cases the longest, so their incubation period would allow more people to recover. Are we taking uh, encouragement from China's figures that they have a 4% um, death to 96% recovery? Okay, so the so the worldwide debt rate is not. You, I think you said fourteen, fifteen percent. The worldwide debt rate is two percent. Two point four, yeah. Generally, for the for the entire world, is roughly about two percent. Oh, you wanted to say something? Go ahead. You you say first. I'm I'm not taking into consideration the ongoing cases. I'm only using the completed cases. So that's okay. why I got that thing. All yeah. right. Okay. So yeah, for the world, as I said, is just about just above two in terms of the debt rate. We suspect when you put all the suspected cases into that, it will actually go down and become something close to one after all is said and done and we do the retrospective data, 1%. Based on that, um, what we spoke about before is 81% of the, those cases being mild, 14% being severe, and there are 5% of that group which would be very severe and needing pro possibly ventilation and ICU care. So those are the figures that we got out of a large study that was done in China approximately a month or three weeks ago and we have been using globally to give us an idea a sense based on our numbers what we should look at in terms of setting up our capacity in hospitals and elsewhere to deal with our cases as our numbers continue to rise so it gives us a benchmark as to what per percent of them will possibly need minor hospital care being mild patients what percent will need supportive care and what su what percent will need ventilation and and in that regard, we're looking at the capacity as we scale up in Kuva, in Cora, and the different sites so that we have capacity if and when the numbers increase. Okay, Pryor. Good morning, Minister Pryor Bihari, AZP News. Good morning, Pryor. Good morning. Good morning. Um, Minister, you didn't really fully answer my question yesterday, so here I go again. I wanted to find out that if someone goes into the Cuba hospital, for example, and they are positive with COVID-19. The relatives, some relatives are skeptical that they may not, information on them may not be forthcoming. How, is there any process in play that someone, that are, you will get information if your relative, for example, is in the HDU, um, you know, machine or is in, the, is in ICU? 
or in any general population there who has tested positive for COVID-19? That is one question, and I have another one. Should I ask it one time? Yeah, sure. Hello? Yes, sure. sure. Go ahead. Yeah. Yes. And my second question is um, the CMO spoke about how sites are chosen um, outside of, um, of the hospitals. Can you just go you know, into a little more detail about this, this procurement process? How are these places chosen? Um, is there a database, for example, in the ministry? Um, you know, why are, why are these spaces chosen and what is the cost to taxpayers? How much does the ministry pay to, to house these, these people at, oh. at these bases? Sure. So I'll try to, I will start with the first, first part. Information, of, information to relatives is not under the domain of the Minister of Health. That will be the responsibility of the clinicians. I don't, I ought not to get involved in giving out information to relatives. The chief medical officer will tell you what are the protocols in place to give out information to relatives. The second part of your question dealing with facilities, we at the ministry, we have a database of all sorts of facilities that can be used for COVID-19. We screen them for two things. One, suitability for the patient, but more importantly, suitability for the community so that the community is not put at risk. There must be a certain amount of spatial arrangements so members of the community are as far away as possible. That is the general guideline. It must be must have sleeping accommodation. These are not hospitals. These are just what you might call holding bays, as we did in Balandra. As per cost, these vary. The cost that I have off the top of my head right now, when we had to house the 60, 68. 68 people from the cruise ship, we are paying for that particular facility to accommodate this cruise ship passengers $85,000 per month. Some facilities are given to us free, and some we will have to pay. And that's the only exact figure I have off the top of my head right now. And the chief medical officer could deal with the issue of information to patients. Yes, so in terms of information to patients, and this is across the public health sector, not specific to Coover, the patient's direct caregiver, who is the medical team that is seeing about the welfare of the patient, is the only person that actually is supposed to give direct information to the relatives, and that holds for Kuva as well. We have recently put into Kuva a medical chief of staff, so that medical chief of staff will give us a little more clarity in terms of who reports to whom in the division. We would not have had a medical chief of staff there before, so that is two days ago we put a medical chief of staff into that institution, so there's better communication not, not only with the clinicians in there, but there's better con communication with the population outside. So that person has been putting procedures in place to ensure that relatives can reach out in a better way um, if they need to. So we have done that a few days ago, and we're looking to, ex to ensure that not only that relatives can reach out, but we had put mechanism in place so that the psychologists and the psychiatrists can actually call in and do video conferencing with some of them, including the staff, which started last week under the auspices of the University of the West Indies. Thank you, Dr. Parasram. Annalisa, Guardian Media Limited. Hi, good morning, gentlemen. Good morning, Annalisa. Good morning, Annalisa. Minister, I wanted to find out, um, we've moved patients to Brooklyn Settlement, but can you tell us how many patients were moved and whether or not these patients are asymptomatic or and if they're not asymptomatic and they're actually in the midst of their recovery? Like at what okay. stage now are these persons being moved and in also in connection with that? Okay. Is it that we're now going to be seeing some of other facilities like this being sought and set up as sort of like you said, holding bays? Yeah. So is that gonna be the new norm? Sure. So I, I know we like to ask the minister operational questions and clinical questions. So the chief medical officer will answer the operational question and the clinical question. And the answer is at the level of the Minister of Health, yes, as I answered prior, 
we have a database of a series of facilities that we are looking at to do with two objectives. One, as a step-down facility, people who are recovering and no longer need to be in a hospital setting so they can recover faster, but at the same time, making sure that there is absolutely no risk to the community. And now the chief medical officer could answer the operational and clinical question. Okay, so basically we transferred 17 persons as a first group out of Kuva last night. They were all asymptomatic for, I would say, between one and six days. Some, some were getting into the seventh day where I had asked that the first test for a negative be done. So they are all asymptomatic people in the convalescent phase. They, if they were not COVID positive, they may not need hospitalization at this point. And that's, that's the, the key fact. Um, it is basically well people that have recovered, but we still have to wait for the negatives to ensure that there is no risk of spread to the population when they are discharged home because they have an infectious disease. So they are, they are all in asymptomatic. Sunil Lala. Yes, hello. Good morning. Hi. Good morning. Good Sunil. morning. Good morning. Um, first question, um, with regards to the COVID hotline, I know you said earlier this week that it has been bombarded with calls. Um, trying to measure the success of it, has any um, hotline calls led to a patient being tested positive? And uh, finally, from me, uh, President Donald Trump yesterday ordered the 3M company in the U.S. to stop exporting those N95 masks to certain countries, with particular um, to Canada and the Latin America. Would this affect us in any way possible in the future? Okay, so thank you. That's a question for me as Minister of Health. Yes. So the hotline is swamped. Yes, we at the last count we got about a hundred, close between a hundred to hundred and fifty calls which needed further investigation. So the hotline did produce that uh, little nugget of gold. What we are doing with the hotline, as I said, and I spoke to the PS yesterday, in addition to take the load off the hotline, especially getting calls which are irrelevant to COVID, and, and, and that is why the hotline is swamped. Um, we brought on eight more doctors, so we ramped up from 10 to 18, but you can't go on like that. I spoke to the PS yesterday. I did promise the country we'll be having an app coming out soon, which will be a screening tool before you go to calls. I am told that the app was uploaded to Google and it's being approved by the different processes that have to go on. Once that is done, we expect the app to be up and running by sometime next week, which will take the load off the physical calling in so that those who don't have access to technology, like the elderly, they will have freer access to the, to the hotline where they need to speak to a real-life doctor, a real-life person. So that is what we are doing with the hotline. Thank you very much. Newsday, Janelle D'Souza. We had 17 um, going to the, coming from Cora and Kuva, um, and they are going to these step-down facilities, I believe. Um, have some of these included, these facilities that include something like guest room total? We've had some questions from the public. Okay, first, so first correction, um, I'm, I'm sorry if we gave the wrong impression. The 17 persons um, that were decanted from Kuva yesterday, they went to Cora, and now the chief medical officer could answer the rest of the question. Yeah, so just repeat the last, last bit of your question, please. People are concerned that when people are being discharged, mm -hmm. that they would be get, um, taken to places like non-hospital facilities, such as guest homes or um, yeah. hotels or things like that. So we want to know, clarify that for them. Sure. Yeah, so, I mean, as Minister would have said, and we said before, we are choosing our sites based on two things. Patients in those who are recovering need to be isolated to some extent from one another. So we have to look out the layout of those places, as well as we have to make sure that there's no risk of communication to the, to the nearing population. So we choose our facilities based on those two elements, the possibility of having proper infection prevention control elements both inside 
as well as outside of the facility. So we're choosing different types of facilities. There would be sometimes guest houses, sometimes um, geriatric homes that we would not have been used for quite some time. But we're looking at sort of dormitory-like facilities that can keep them separate and apart. Those are the kinds of facilities that would be best. As I said, they, they have no clinical illness at that time. They medically very well. So it's just somewhere, somewhere we can house them to ensure that they fully recovered in, by way of having their negative tests. And it does not require a hospital setting to do so. Joshua Sibangal, CNC3. Hi, good morning, Minister. First good question morning. to you. Um, how many children and healthcare professionals have been tested and how many positive results do we have from those tests? Okay, so that's a good question. About a month ago, the directive from the Ministry of Health, the same way we are treating the elderly as a special population, as I outlined this morning, we are also treating healthcare workers as a special population for special attention. Um, so that policy is in place, and the Chief Medical Officer will explain the operations of that policy and speak to the fact of our children. Okay, so in terms of the, the policy, basically we have an increased window of testing for healthcare workers, anybody who is ill, whether you have contact with someone that would have traveled or not because you're generally in a high-risk setting. So that's the policy as it relates to healthcare workers. In terms of total number tested, I don't have the total number tested, but anyone that would have met the criteria would have been tested. In, in terms of children, they're not being treated as a, as a special population by way of testing. Um, but of course, primary, if they are primary or secondary or tertiary contact, they will be tested. Or if they have symptoms that are suggestive of any form of the illness as, as being deemed suspect, they will be tested as well. So uh, we have not disaggregated the number of tests that were done on children as yet, but we can get those figures in, in the coming weeks and months. Oh, please forgive me. I forgot to answer prior. Um, I think someone asked about the embargo on N95s. Mm -hmm. I, I don't want to be said I'm skirting the question. Um, yes, I note that there is an embargo on um, supplies coming out of the United States, but let me assure you, we have incoming, I think yesterday we got in 6,095 masks. Mm -hmm. Next, over the next two weeks, we have about between 20 to 30,000 N95s coming in. Um, so there is no shortage of N95s. However, as I keep saying, if the number of cases escalates because people don't stay home, the first thing you are going to run out of is N95s. And that is why we are urging the population. The healthcare system has stood up to the strain and stress so far. Even with those 40 positive cases from one um, source. That was a big stress test. We passed it. However, that hard-won victory will amount to nothing if the population does not heed the advice from the Honorable Prime Minister coming down to do one simple thing, stay home, so that we do not stress the system anymore. International supply chains have been disrupted. That's a fact of life. But don't test the system because of recklessness. That's the only message I want to give out this morning. Thank you very much, Minister. I recognize TV6. Hello. Hi. Good morning. Good morning. Could the Chief Medical Officer speak to um, the treatment plan for confirmed patients, oh, particularly those particularly those who are not doing well, because I'm seeing a former Minister of Health calling for clinical trials of a certain drug, hydroxychloroquine. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay, so I will take the first part about clinical trials, because that's in my domain as Minister of Health. Then the Chief Medical Officer will speak to a particular treatment plan. I conferred with the Attorney General on this, because I have to take legal advice. When a drug is registered and when the Minister of Health signs off on a drug registration certificate, it is signed off for a particular clinical use. For example, let's use a simple, a simple thing, paracetamol, Panadol. It's signed off for mild to moderate pain, fever, and so on. If 
we tell healthcare workers and doctors, I know how to protect he um, doctors and nurses. If we tell them to use it to treat diabetes, we are now telling doctors to use a drug to treat a condition for which is not registered. The doctor and the state is then open to both civil and criminal liability. The issue of trials is one that the chief medical officer, as head of the ethics committee, will be looking at in conjunction with the University of the West Indies to come up with proper protocols for the use of experimental drugs, whether it's hydroxychloroquine, chloroquine, interferon, but it has to be done in such a way that we protect the doctor from criminal and civil liability for, at, for prescribing it. We have to protect the nurse from criminal and civil liability for administering it. And I have to protect the taxpayer because this is a very litigious society. So once we overcome the legal challenges being advised to me by the Attorney General and the ethical considerations that the Chief Medical Officer now speak about, we may be able to do that. So any trial in Trinidad and Tobago has to come through an ethics committee. Most of the time, if it's a wide-scale trial, it has to come through the Ministry of Health Ethics Committee, which is chaired by myself. The University of the West Indies, this is not a Trinidad and Tobago study. This is a study that was that is being done in other parts of the world by WHO and led by WHO. So it is. we are following suit in Trinidad, the University of the West Indies is taking, taking lead on it. They will send us a proposal at the Ministry of Health, and we will look at it as quickly as we can by the Ethics Committee of the Ministry of Health to determine if there's feasibility, if it is ethical to use for our patient group, and then we'll make a recommendation to the Minister f in terms of the ethics of the study, which happens with any study that we have to do in Trinidad and Tobago. So that process has to happen first, but it will be triggered um, by the University of the West Indies when they send the proposal to us. And of course, that what, once we, as a committee, can review it, we will send that onwards to the Honorable Minister. In yeah. terms of mm -hmm. your second part of the question, as of this point, there's no recommended drug-specific treatment for the treatment of COVID-19. There's no vaccine as yet. In so we are doing supportive care for patients with COVID-19. Supportive care means that we are using other medications and other treatment regimes. We're using ventilators. We're using ICU support if need be. But we are, we are not going to use a medication that has not been approved by WHO or approved by the Trinidad and Tobago Drug Advisory Committee and the Honorable Minister in our patients at this point. Let me just amplify that point a little bit because I don't want Trinidad and Tobago to jump onto the bandwagon of using experimental treatments. Experimental treatments, which are born out of anecdotal evidence in a small number of patients, that is not reliable scientific data to base treatment plans on. And I will give you an example. There was a vaccine developed for dengue, new vaccine. It was administered in Philippines, and you could, you could look at this. Thousands of children died. Thousands of children died because that vaccine was given to children. We have to be very careful how we latch on to a fad because people in this COVID crisis are grasping at straws. And I understand that. I empathize. But we have to be very careful and to be led by the science and to be led by evidence. And I, I, as minister, will not open up the taxpayer to lawsuits and my doctors and nurses to criminal and civil liability, but I want to protect patients at the same time. Thank you very much, minister. I recognize Loop Titi. Good morning, everyone. Nika Parsonal. Good morning, Nika. Um, I noted 
what Dr. Parasaram had said about these step down facilities, and it made me think a little bit about, you know, as we look forward to more hopefully recoveries in the future. Um, is there any further care that happens even after that? These these recoveries, these discharged patients. What do they have to do or, or apply, or is there any other treatment that they have to undergo as they get integrated back into their rhythms? So I, I think just like any other viral illness, it, and especially with COVID-19, you find that certain people will have a decreased ability to, to exercise or even um, there would be some shortness of breath that is associated. So it's a gradual increase in your general function and going back to normalcy for some people. There are other people who would have had mild illnesses that can be basically from a physiological perspective can be as normal as if you have a mild viral illness and go right back in. What we are doing at the facilities is just doing nursing care, which will ensure that we're looking at all the patients on a daily basis. We're still monitoring them, but they don't need hospital level care. So they need home care to some extent with some oversight with the medical practitioners. And But the key to it is, is that as I said before, we re holding on to the patients to ensure that there is no spread in the population. Because if we send someone early on with a positive result still, there's a risk of spread to the population. So we have to make sure that we get the two negatives before we can discharge. But generally speaking, the persons that we step down are very well people. Express. Hi, good morning. Camille Hunt from the Express. Good morning, good morning. Camille. Um, good morning. Minister or CMO, um, can we get an update on the one person that has been discharged, any follow-up assessments being done with that person? And also, um, we saw patients complaining about the quality of food that they're being provided at the, um, the Hoover Hospital. Minister, are you satisfied with the, the meals that are being provided or are these patients' complaints unreasonable? I cannot judge whether the complaints are reasonable. I will ask you to look at today's newspapers where the North Central Regional Health Authority put out a press release with photographs saying what types of meals the patients in Coover are getting. Um, before I hand over to the Chief Medical Officer, I just want to remind that we do have Dr. Kelly Elaine Mike dealing with COVID and cancer. It's a very important topic. So if some if some attention could be paid to that, because um, at a press conference at the ministry, when we had it live, there were several questions from media about COVID and cancer. So please take advantage of her presence here this morning. So in terms of the patient follow-up, generally speaking, that is under the auspices of the County Medical Officer of Health. And they would follow up patients even at least for seven days after discharge, after getting your second negative. So that has been done. I, I have not received any reports from them saying that there's any untoward reaction from anyone. So they continue to do their follow-up as a matter of course. Power 102. Hello, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Kimberly D'Souza from Power 102 and Izzo Media. Minister Dial Singh, I have two questions for you. Sure. Um, this one, I know that we're seeing our numbers are rising, and we definitely don't want our local healthcare workers to become burnt out. I know you said that we were supposed to be expecting some Cuban nurses. Yes. Can you give them? They will arrive. That's one. Sure. <laughs> and, um, I read an article this morning that said that some patients at Belandra were getting therapy sessions. Um, can you confirm if it's true? Yeah. And is we extended to Cuba and Cora? Thanks. Sure. So, um, update on the Cubans. Yes, we got the work permits approved. We are now working with Caribbean Airlines to arrange a flight to bring them down, hopefully, um, I am saying by the middle of next week. Two, the issue of um, people in Balandra. And it doesn't apply to people in Balandra only because I was asked this question yesterday about mental health. And it's a very important question. And I think next week we will bring Dr. Hazel Othello um, to talk about, about it. Patients suffering from COVID, whether you are suspected, confirmed, or whatever, are going to be in need of psychological counseling. And we have provided that service um, at um, Balandra. It mm -hmm. will be provided to all cohorts of patients um, who need it, um, because this is a very traumatic time for them. 
remember this issue of COVID is new, it's novel, and they are going through an absolute horrendous time, especially those cruise ship persons. Put yourself in this place. You are stranded off the coast of Guad Guadeloupe with COVID-positive patients. You come down here. You are rushed to a facility in Balandra. 40 are tested positive. You go to Kuva. I understand the strain they are under. I understand it. But we are doing the best we can, which includes psychological counseling. Thank you. Thank you. Lissana Leibert. Yes. Um, while it takes it again, uh, to the CMO. You said there were about 10 to 15 repeat tests, but uh, my belief was that the Belanja group alone had been tested at least twice. You know? So to, to re return to that question, could you give the exact number of persons who have been tested so far? And the, the right. second question, we had the sick, our sixth death on Wednesday, and the suggestion was the person was admitted very late, possibly too late to, to save uh, the, the person. Could you give an exact date as to when that person asked to be tested or reported symptoms? Okay, so so in terms of your first question, I think I need to get back to the media with regards to how many retests we have had. Um, so I don't have those figures with me at this point. So let me get back to you all with the figures. So I'll ask the Caribbean Public Health Agency, who are the agencies that actually do the test for us, to give us those figures through our Trinidad Public Health Lab. Um, in terms of your second question, you wanted to basically understand if the person presented late on in the illness, yes? I think so, um, yeah. He's saying something, but I'm not here. Lissano? Yes, sorry. I wanted to know the exact date that the person okay. reported symptoms. The exact date that the person reported symptoms. I think, I mean, we're going again into the, into the realm of patient confidentiality. Um, but what I, what I can say is that we are encouraging persons not to stay home with symptoms and don't present because we can see what the outcome will be. For any illness, any viral illness, we have seen it with H1N1, a lot of our deaths have been when people present late to the healthcare facilities. Whether it be by phone, we now have a hotline, or actually coming to a facility, we are telling people once you get symptoms and you think you're at risk, please either call in or present, especially if you're in the high risk group, because when you present late, there's no specific treatment for this disease, which makes it that much harder to actually be able to control it when it is at, at a late stage of disease. So we want people to present to us as early as possible. We pick up the cases and we are able to treat you in the best way that we can. So I think that's the message that we want to get out. Thank you very much, Dr. Paraswaram. At this time, I would like to ask the Minister of Health to give us a final statement, please. Thank you very much, Minister Cox. And I want to thank the Chief Medical Officer who has been at my side throughout this um, enterprise. I want to thank Dr. Kelly Elaine Mike for coming out this morning and sharing her expertise on cancer and COVID. I want to speak directly to the population of Trinidad and Tobago. Ladies and gentlemen, Trinidad and Tobago is one of over 200 territories. We are now joined by the Falkland Islands. That is in the midst of a global pandemic, dealing with an invisible, odorless, colorless enemy. We are at war, if I could paraphrase the Honorable Prime Minister. We are at war. And in a war, there has to be unity of purpose, unity of command. The Honorable Prime Minister has taken charge of this situation. But we, who are his lieutenants and generals and infantrymen, have to be in lockstep with the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister has issued a clarion call as clear as crystal that the only way to beat this colorless, odorless, invasive enemy is to stay home. This morning, we dealt with two vulnerable groups, the elderly and patients with cancer. We want to show our collective discipline as a country. I go back to the watchwords, discipline, production, tolerance. Those watchwords have served us well since independence. If we adhere to those watchwords, and if we listen to everyone from the Honorable Prime Minister come down, 
I guarantee you we can beat this enemy. And in beating the enemy, Trinidad and Tobago, as small as it is, but as disciplined as we are, could emerge victors and be a beacon for the entire world to see. I urge you, stay home, stay safe. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much, Minister Dial Singh. We have come to the end of today's virtual media conference. And do remember that the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Communications are your only credible sources of government information on COVID-19. But before we close, I would like to thank the Trinidad and Tobago Association for the Hearing Impaired, who continues to provide their services to ensure the deaf and hard of hearing get the messages about COVID-19 from the government during this period. A special thanks also to Stephen Dukran, the Public Relations Officer of the Association. I am Donna Cox, Minister of Communication. Thank you for joining us today as the government continues its efforts to flatten the curve and beat COVID-19. Stay home and stay safe. May God bless Trinidad and Tobago.